Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webcast today about data and AI for the future of finance. My name is Dominic Riedel. I am Business Development Manager at NTT Global Data Centers, and I have the pleasure to be your host and moderator today. And together with our partners, Cloud and Eurocat and Prof. London, we would like to provide you some valuable insights about this topic from different perspectives in the next 60 minutes. And to start right away, uh, let me give you a very brief overview of what we do at NTT. So, NTT is known as one of the ICT service providers worldwide, and our portfolio spans from ICT infrastructure, such as submarine cables, location data centers, connectivity, and cloud always services, technical services, managed services, and to specific industry related expertise, intelligent business, intelligent workplace, intelligent infrastructure, and intelligent cybersecurity. And yeah, as, as I am part of the Global Data Centers Division, I'd like to give you a slightly deeper insight um, what Global Data Centers means for us. We provide the space, the power, the connectivity, and the security for our customers' IT systems and um, our customers direct access to all the major cloud providers, hyperscalers, and internet exchanges from our data centers. And since three years, we operate and, um, and develop our technology experience lab, formerly known as the Innovation Lab, with more than 140 different partners and 80 different use cases, where we give um, customers the opportunity to test and validate um, yeah, new and innovative kind of IT scenarios in a productive environment. So as our topic today is finance in Europe, I also have some numbers um, with, with me. And um, yeah, they state basically the status quo of technology adoption in finance companies. So for example, 79% of European banks have a digital strategy for the future, which is actually quite good. Um, but only 33% of European banks have defined specific action points. Um, and just 18% of them see data as an asset and use it actively. So there's quite a backlog. And to underline this fact, I have an, another survey um, about the impact of and readiness for um, yeah, AI adoption in finance. And it states out that about 86% of senior uh, financial management expects a significant impact from the use of AI in financial services, but only 25% are ready to use it. And so we see a, a huge backlog of technology adoption, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence. But there are a lot of um, quite good um, yeah, technologies and especially use cases that can be adopted uh, from AI into the finance fields, which are, for example, credit scoring, algorithmic trading, risk management, fraud detection, or also robo-advisory. And if we look behind all these use cases, we basically see three main requirements um, from a technical perspective. And that's on the one hand side, the IT infrastructure, so the hardware uh, in terms of capacity, storage capacity, um, connectivity, but also, for example, cloud infrastructure. Um, the second main requirement is the AI stuff. So uh, the software, the coding, the algorithms, and also more than important, the usable data of usable and valid data for AI. And so one learning for me is on the one hand side that the right set of partners and technologies is key for success, 
which is uh, the reason why we're collaborating with uh, uh, three partners that, um, that will after after my talk. And the second big learning is that the data center is basically the foundation for technology and data. And Dominic, and, your, voice, your sound is a little bit um, chopped, chopped off sometimes. Is there something with the internet connection that you can improve? Okay. So I try I just. Okay. I try to, to speak uh, yeah, better to my microphone. Um, yeah, basically. As I come from the field, I have um, more in terms of the data center agreements for finance companies, and that is basically the technical. And on the one hand side, about the technical requirements, it's a lot about data math. So it's good to have a stable on-premise environment with direct connection to public cloud. Um, in terms of blockchain, you, for example, need regional distributed environments with low latency. And in terms of AI and data analytics, um, you need high performance computing and therefore high power and cooling. In terms of business requirements, um, it's necessary to have business continuity 24 7. Um, you see, yeah, nice to have cost flexibility um, and to avoid. Can, can you maybe yeah. move your part to the end of the session because uh, your your voice is really chopped off like the internet connection isn't uh, smooth like it's um it's a little bit hard to understand uh, i would suggest okay. maybe we um we let uh, this, the other speakers go first and then you add your part at the end so you can uh, try to fix the internet connection until then okay i can is, uh, yeah. i i only have i only have one minute to go so i will, okay. I will just finish that part okay and yeah. then then i can hand over all right yeah. okay wonderful so yeah, just just to, to skip it, um, we have also legal requirements in terms of GBT, GDPRA and uh, in terms of data so sovereignty. We have uh, regulations like, for example, risk management, inspection rights, and so on. And um, it's also necessary to provide uh, necessary certifications, like, for example, um, yeah, ISO 24, uh, 27001 um, from BSI, and so on. And if you want to learn more, because I just uh, gave you a short wrap up of uh, what what uh, yeah, requirements are necessary in terms of data centers for, for finance, you can uh, join our entity summit on the 10th of September and learn more about all that. And to dive directly into the topics from our um, speakers, we have basically three main speakers today. The one is Yannick Ahrens from Cloud and Teeth, who will talk about a security-focused Kubernetes platform for AI-based applications. Then we have Stefan Hinze from Neurocat, um, who will talk about fraud and money laundering is bad, deploying unsafe AI is worse. And Simon Kenny from Hoptroff London about traceable timing, trusted timestamps to underpin clean data. So um, I really... Um, Hope that you will enjoy the talks. You can uh, type your questions in, into the chat and I will um, bring them up to the speakers. And yeah, hope that you will have a nice session and uh, enjoy the talks. Yeah, so let's uh, hope that my uh, connection is better. Unfortunately, I don't have fiber to the desk. Uh, maybe that will change one day. Um, so yeah, thanks uh, from, from my side for being here. My name is Jan Gardens. I'm a cloud architect at uh, Cloud and Teed. We are a data center provider based in uh, Dresden, Germany. And today I'd like to um, give you a short introduction to our managed Kubernetes service. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Kubernetes, um, it is a container orchestration uh, platform that was released by Google in uh, 2014 and has now become the de facto standard in uh, the field of, con of container orchestration. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the field of uh, container orchestration isn't as, simply, uh, as simple as installing a web browser, for example. So uh, you need a partner for this, and uh, today I'd like to make a case for us. 
This is today's agenda, very brief uh, company uh, presentation. Then uh, we'll speak about the service itself, the underlying infrastructure, and wrapping up with a real world use case of our partner, Head for BT. So, Cloud and Heat was uh, founded in uh, 2011 with the idea to uh, reuse uh, the heat that is emitted by server hardware. We then eventually emerged as a full stack data center provider with uh, different sites the largest in uh, Dresden and uh, Frankfurt am Main. And we're not uh, only a public cloud provider, but also we're offering um, on-premise solutions and uh, co-location. Um, maybe our qualifications accept uh, many successful projects in the past. Um, we are also ISO uh, 27001 certified and uh, part of the European Auditor Project. And we have a uh, long running experience uh, with operating server infrastructure. Maybe as a bonus, um, we're almost using exclusively um, open source software. Let's skip that. I'm a salesperson. Green team. coming back to our founding idea uh, to uh, reuse um, the waste heat of service. We use that in several sites to heat uh, buildings. Uh, some some apartments, for example, in Hamm, also in the uh, European. And for that, we are water cooling our service, which uh, increases uh, the energy efficiency of the setup, and also by eliminating onboard fans, we reduce uh, the total power consumption. There is uh, a demonstrator in the NTT Technology Experience Lab. If you want to see our, I don't know if it's open right now if you want to see our hardware live and in action. Cloud and Heat is um, a kind of smallish data center provider. We are by no means a hyperscaler. And uh, to be honest, we never intended to. Instead, uh, we focus on uh, providing customly tailored infrastructure to our customers. Uh, and that are different flavors. The following list is not exclusive, uh, exhaustive, sorry. But just to give you um, an idea, uh, we can uh, set up a bare metal rack. We can uh, do that and uh, install and operate uh, a SQL stack, which is a security hardened um, cloud operating system. I will come to that in a second. Or our most recent addition is to place uh, our managed Kubernetes service on top of that. Yeah. Managed uh, Kubernetes. Uh, the service um, started as a small prototype in um, the beginning of 2019, and it quickly grew into a production ready Kubernetes distribution. It includes, among other things, besides the standard stuff, uh, various kinds of storage, access uh, to GPU on demand, uh, NVMe support, um, and so on. And what we're doing here is uh, that we're assembling well-tested and battle-proven software um, and made modifications and additions wherever necessary. For example, we developed our own external load balancer and made that available as a Kubernetes resource because uh, the built-in solution in, uh, in OpenStack uh, just didn't uh, suit our needs. Our cluster is currently uh, deployed on top of either OpenStack or SQL Stack, but uh, bare metal installations um, aren't an issue and uh, are possible. Let's uh, take a quick look at um, our cluster. By default, the cluster is unreachable from the internet because it resides in, in a private network. That means it is uh, kind of secure by design. Um, access is granted uh, via dedicated gateway nodes that also act as a load balancer for the Kubernetes control plane. The cluster is um, highly available and designed to be uh, resilient to outages. Now, what you can see here is a so-called multi-master setup. We have um, in the middle, CP stands for a control plane, and uh, the control plane is spread among uh, three different master nodes. That means if uh, one master node goes down, the other two can take over and the cluster keeps running. Also, all virtual machines, that you can see here in the image, are uh, distributed in uh, different availability zones in our data center, our data centers, 
So a power outage or disruption to the internet connectivity um, doesn't harm the reachability of uh, the cluster. Uh, we built a storage solution in the cluster that is based on, on Brook and uh, deployed inside of each uh, cluster. And uh, monitoring is done uh, with uh, Prometheus uh, and Grafana, uh, provided by uh, the Kube Prometheus pr uh, project and also deployed in each cluster. Yeah, well, what, what are our advantages? So we are offering uh, the full package that is a security hardened Kubernetes cluster um, uh, on top of uh, sustainable hardware infrastructure. We're doing 24-7 uh, operations and uh, we're developing and designing um, custom solutions uh, depending on your individual use case. Now, um, as a cloud provider, we make heavy use of virtualization to share physical hardware among our users. I mean, the most obvious reasons for that are cost efficiency and energy efficiency. But um, for some users, uh, the traditional means of separation might not be enough. And there are two, two solutions to that. The first one is um, just to build a private cloud with hardware that is used exclusively by one tenant. So to have hardware separation between uh, tenants, which uh, goes against the cost and energy efficiency. And uh, the second option, and this is the part uh, that we are heavily investing in, is uh, to harden the virtualized infrastructure and to offer a verifiable tenant separation. SQL stack, that is spelled with um, small letters, is a joint venture of Cloud and Heat and SQLnet. The letter is um, a large German security company. And SQL stack develops the platform SQL stack, this time spelled in camel case, um, which extends the OpenStack uh, cloud rating system with uh, security features and hardens it wherever necessary. An example is shown here in the image. I think it's quite uh, blurred. I mean, the slides, uh, I'm sorry, they aren't designed for a webinar. I hope you can bear it, but, but, but the details there aren't important. Just uh, this just a brief overview. Uh, what you can see is um, multiple clusters that run on the same hardware, but uh, they are separated. They're, they're separated from each other. And this, is, uh, this tenant separation is achieved, uh, for example, via volume encryption, via network traffic encryption, and prospectively uh, joined by hardware support like uh, Intel's SGX. And uh, features like uh, VPN as a service, which offers a secure access to the cluster, or certified ex um, ex a way to access the cluster, and uh, the so-called bring your own key, where you hold the credentials used for uh, cryptographic operations locally, uh, enhance the tenant's um, data privacy and uh, security. Now let's wrap up with a real world use case uh, of our partner, AF4BD. AF4BD is uh, the developer of uh, cognitive business robotics, short uh, CDR. And to give an example, uh, imagine a company that receives handwritten orders uh, via fax, yes, that is still a thing. I was amazed myself. And uh, traditionally, someone um, has to enter that into a computer, which takes a lot of uh, person hours. And uh, the CDR can just uh, do that for you. It uses AI models to interpret uh, their sheets. Uh, AF4BD was uh, formerly uh, an infrastructure as a service uh, custom exclusively for us. That means we offered them the resources and they uh, run the virtual machines on our servers, but uh, they quickly realized that uh, managing and operating their, their infrastructure, this is not their core competency, uh, but uh, what they want to do is uh, they want to provide and develop AI services. And so after a short experiment with their own cluster, uh, they uh, turned to us. And this is where we started with the uh, managed Kubernetes prototype which then grew, just to give an idea of what they're using. Their software stack includes uh, a distributed MongoDB installation, uh, TensorFlow for AI, 
and uh, some web services. All of that is uh, containerized, which makes uh, Kubernetes an ideal platform for this. Um, for obvious reasons, L4BD has high requirements in uh, data security and data privacy, and they were uh, taken into account when we developed um, the managed Kubernetes platform. Uh, they will soon um, migrate to ZikuStack. Uh, currently, they run on their own dedicated uh, hardware in a co-location spot in our data center in Frankfurt am Main. Yeah, uh, we uh, came quite far in the last couple of months, and I'm sure there's uh, still much ahead of us. And by that, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm finished. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm aware that uh, 10 minutes isn't, uh, isn't much. I hope I wasn't too fast. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, just ask them now, or here you can see uh, the contact information. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Yannick. Uh, your quality also was, was uh, very good. <laughs> so probably better than mine. I hope uh, everyone can understand myself as well. Uh, now, so there are no questions actually uh, in the chat, but I guess um, you will be here the, over the whole webcast, right? So you will be able to um, to answer any questions in the chat directly, right? Ah, okay. Uh, sorry, my uh, presentation was in full screen, so I couldn't see that uh, Zoom told me that you wanted to unmute me. Yes, I'll stick around. So you can ask me anytime. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Cool. Um, okay, so um, let's hand over directly to Stefan from NeuroCat. And he will share his screen in a second. So, hi, my name is Stefan. Can, uh, first question, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Second question, can you see my screen? Yes, as well. Great. So, yes. Um, first of all, thank you, Dominic, for this opportunity. Um, yeah, my name is Stefan. I'm CEO from NeuroCAD. So, and we're helping our clients in evaluation and improvement of your AI models and data and yeah, and enable a safe, secure AI deployment um, in the right quality. So first intro, maybe you've heard from it. There are a lot of uh, standardization and regulation activities around the globe and uh, in every domain. So here in this case, uh, last year uh, in London, in England, um, um, there was the first thing what was going on court. Uh, there was a trading system and they don't understand the black box and that's why they don't understand uh, or don't understood the risks. Yeah, and every regulation in the end of the day um, addressed the explainability, the robustness, safety, security, performance, bias, fairness, trustworthiness and all the buzzwords and yeah, and our solutions help you to um, address that. Yeah, ML code is just a small fraction. Um, there exists much, much more in the AI um, development or deployment pipelines. Yeah, and um, we we offer um, a, a tool for analysis, help them in process management and verifications and monitoring of AI. This five major problems. First, uh, I mentioned it is the safety security stuff. It's most uh, a rob robustness issue. Um, These models are very vulnerable against hacker manipulation or any other common corruptions uh, uh, in the environment and fraudster uh, can easily identify um, this hacker manipulation. Yeah, there's the black box issue. There are no rules anymore, like in the classic software, no ifs and else. All um, the development is data driven. Yeah, the performance problem, uh, how my system will work on unseen data. 
that's a major in, uh, issue and how I can improve it constant, uh, constantly. Um, the trust in AI stuff. So um, we need um, some processes for quality assurance and certification. Um, so that's why um, we have a focus on our um, testbed and monitor systems and uh, want to launch this year a seal of approval. Yeah, what uh, NewCat is doing. So we grow up organically, no funding. So that's why um, we need to understand the market and we offer independent services for quality assurance and help our clients in compliance issue and certification issues concerning AI. And second, we offer a, um, a platform that our clients can do the stuff in self-service and can improve uh, the systems automatically. Um, they are usually we doing a lot of pre-market assurance for safety, security and quality. So um, before the AI uh, models will be launched or deployed, clients came to us and um, and say and ask us uh, in support to do um, some weak spot uh, weak spots analysis. And uh, yeah, we have strong experience in it since three years. Have the right software tools because you need software to understand the quality. Uh, you cannot do it anymore by code reviews like in a classic software. Yeah, and second. There's a whole change management. This um, systems uh, will optimize con um, continuously, and in this process, in this algorithm change protocol or process, we have to write solutions uh, to do it efficiently. How our software solution looks like? So we have here our test bed and monitor. It's very easy to use. It has all um, state-of-the-art methods plus unique methods which will be, um, which was developed by, by our researchers. We have seven strong focused researchers on AI quality and um, growing. Yeah, and um, this test bed is one solution. And then we, um, we offer a lot of add-ons for runtime. We call that protect and explainer. It makes the systems robust, uh, agnostic, very ag tech agnostic. Um, while uh, um, uh, they improve the performance, it's uh, really unique uh, on the globe. And yeah, we have solutions to, to explain the decisions uh, from these um, models. Yeah, um, here is a classic um, AI um, development pipeline. So we have here um, the evaluation and uh, the test tools and monitor tools. Um, um, all is very easy and can be very easy integrate in, in the in the pipelines. Uh, um, and on the other hand, on the inference side, uh, um, our add-on systems help them to to get compliance and um, a safe to secure uh, AI deployment. So we are here in the middle. We can connect very easy the data sources, the ML models, or inputs agnostic and with the platform and then we have here our methods um, to help to understand the quality. Yeah, there exists a lot of use cases of course um, um, the finance use cases too we worked with a huge bank and helped them um, to secure a credit scoring system and uh, uh, fraud detection systems and the fraud detection systems need to be robust because for the fraud stars, uh, it's very easy to identify uh, weak spots after they understood only a, a machine is doing the job. Here's a case study. In this case, uh, for, for a huge automotive company, yeah, we saved a lot of time and money and headaches. Usually our clients has not only a time and money issue, more than that is an IP problem because um, robustness experts or, or quality experts are very rare in the world and um, it makes no sense for the companies to build up own resources. They want to focus on their core, business, core businesses and that's why they came to us. Yeah, and these clients here in this case say we have an USP uh, in robustness and comprehensibility 
concerning testing and improvement. Here's another uh, client, uh, Deutsche Telekom. Here we, we help them to evaluate and improve in speech recognition system. Yeah, we, we saved, of course, money and time. That's good. And they are very happy with our work too. There are some other companies who are working with, um, I see some, something is missing. Uh, now we are in the energy sector too. There exists a lot of safety security concern, but you see uh, it's not only a focus on automotive. So um, close to every domain has problems in safety, security and quality. Yeah, definitely we, we can, um, yeah, that's what our client's thinking. We are leading company in robustness. So we can analyze and improve um, the robustness of the systems in the best way. We can handle large data sets and inputs, fusion inputs. Uh, um, yeah, we, we have a, lot, a strong access to here in Europe to, to regulation and standardization companies. Here in Germany, we're leading um, the standardization uh, committee, uh, committee as an Obmann. Yeah, our software solution is, is ready to use and um, yeah, we have very uh, have some patents pendings, and yeah, we help you to enable a great quality assurance and certification. So thank you for your time, and um, yeah, hopefully it was a little bit helpful. Thank you. Any questions, or shall we do it? Perfect. Later? Thank you, Stefan. So, thank you, Stefan. There is one question from the from the audience, and uh, we'll ask with your sector. So, if you have any use cases or experiences from the energy sector. Yes. Um, in this case. Um, we have uh, energy trading systems. What we uh, now we're making a vulnerability analysis for energy trading system, and for uh, um, what's the English word? Maybe someone can help me. Um, Steuer, Steuerung für für ein Stromkraftwerk. So uh, a controller for um, an intelligent controller for a uh, um, power factory. So is that is it clear? So AI driven regler. <laughs> Don't know the mm. word English regler. Yeah, controller is probably um, yeah, controller. Word, yeah. Thank you, Jan. I see. okay. Uh, I think Dominic is struggling with the audio connection. Um, but I think the next thing, if there's not any more questions, is um, Simon. So let me just unmute you. Wonderful. Um, Stefan, can you stop, stop sharing yeah, your screen? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, thank you. Thanks a lot. Hello, everybody. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. My name's uh, Simon Kenny, and I'm the CEO of uh, Hopdroff London. And we are in the business of uh, providing traceable, accurate time as a network service. Um, just to give some sort of background of this, um, people spend a lot of money on uh, developing software applications and optimizing uh, those applications. But when they're actually deployed in the field, one of the critical inputs they rely on is the local uh, clock uh, device for the timing. And if that clock is left unsynchronized, uh, the clocks will drift and they will be fast and slow. So it's not consistent one way or another. Um, and that means the timestamps 
that appear in the uh, applications will frequently be wrong because they'll reflect whatever the drift is of the clock. And as a result of that, the sequence and interval and application change will also be wrong. Now that has um, implications for uh, artificial intelligence platforms which would want to use uh, those timestamps because uh, they'll fundamentally be unreliable and they can't be a trusted variable. So to generate accurate and traceable timestamps, um, which I would describe as clean application timestamps, you need to synchronize uh, the device clocks with a trusted source so that they can prove they are true. Now this is referred to commonly as traceability, uh, which is that the local device clock needs to be able through an unbroken chain of comparisons, trace itself back to a reference source so that it can prove that it was the same time as that reference source and therefore you can trust the timestamp. Now in the past, this has been a very um, expensive and uh, infrastructure intensive exercise to do uh, because the future of computing is uh, distributed uh, to different locations and connected over faster and faster lines with more and more complex applications. Um, and so you need, if you want to keep the clocks right everywhere, to in the past, you would have needed to install uh, local clocks, you'd have needed to install connectivity to the trusted source, you'd have needed to distribute the time to the servers, and then you'd needed to monitor to show that they're all true. So what we identified was that uh, there was a gap in um, synchronization, keeping up with the speed of applications. Um, so we decided to make this a traceable service. So what we've done is we've created a network time feed um, from uh, cloud grandmaster clocks. Uh, we've developed a PTP software client, which um, PTP is the precision time protocol. Uh, software client that is loaded on to the server and that will then steer the local device clock and keep the logs and that then gives you application timestamps that are clean and in terms of sequence and interval and time then becomes a trusted variable in your data records instead of being something which is uh, whatever the guess or whatever the drift was of your fast or slow clock. The network we developed uh, is global. Um, we have timing centers in three locations. We have two in New York. Uh, we have another in uh, London, uh, which is also uh, a development center as well. And we have another in Tokyo. And these are connected uh, each um, by low latency uh, connection lines, which allow us to share time. And uh, the triangle of time is then checked between the three locations. Now within each location, there are three different sources of time which are compared. So the first would be the standard, everyone's familiar with GPS, but then we also use the Russian constellation, which is called uh, GLONASS. And down in Tokyo, we also use the Chinese constellation, which is Beidou 2. Now each of those uh, is then connected to a clock and the time on different clocks is compared. And that's what gives you your reference, your triangle of time to confirm that you've actually got accuracy. In order to give extra resilience to the network, we've also connected to one of the primary sources of time because time comes from a consensus of 70 different scientific institutions around the world, each of which keeps uh, highly, highly accurate atomic clocks. In the extreme cases, these clocks are keeping time to 18 digits after the decimal. So going down into unimaginably fine measurements of time uh, and we have connected uh, to a feed of that, which comes over from uh, Sweden and then comes to our London centre. So in the event, um, unlikely and hopefully um, will never happen event that the satellite systems go down, we actually have a, a resilient source of time, which then feeds into the network and will maintain uh, time for our customers. So once we get the time to the data centre, what actually happens? Well, once the time goes into the um, uh, data center, our application is sitting on a uh, server because in the financial services industry, the requirement is that the time should be accurate at the application and not simply at the gateway to the data center or at some, uh, some other point. It's the application that's actually executing. So we steer the system clock and that's all we do. 
we do not touch the application. We have no interference with it at all. All we do is make sure that the system clock is accurate so that when the application calls on it, you will have uh, an accurate timestamp. And that accurate timestamp is then um, put into a timing log and that is available in um, uh, a GUI where you can look at the uh, condition of your timing at any um, individual point if you want to monitor and if you want to recall um, the status of your timing in the event of a dispute. I mean, you've had the example of somebody uh, wanting to um, uh, take a robot to court for its actions and hold it responsible. Well, if you want to hold uh, a machine responsible, one of the things you need is accurate data logs which show what the machine was actually doing. Uh, and that's why these timing regulations have come in in financial services, is to ensure that the quality of data is sufficient, that should there be a need to reconstruct events after um, something has happened, that the data logs are reliable and trusted data. And that's why um, that, that clean data is essential um, for uh, new um, developments like AI. I have included uh, use cases in this because I wasn't sure how much uh, time I would have, but examples of how this is actually used in, 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 to relevance to um, AI is customers use the, um, the accurate timing uh, to um, define the latency signatures um, within their system and also um, to other trusted parties. So that as part of the um, uh, authentication of data, um, timestamps have to be within um, certain parameters. So, so the applications go beyond just the pure compliance um, uh, aspect of this. Once the data is actually, um, or time is a trusted variable, you can use time to define uh, processes which are uh, repeated frequently, look at the uh, standard deviations which happen on that, and then when they're, they're occurrences happen outside those standard deviations, you can identify that as um, something that needs to be examined, maybe sandboxed, before it actually uh, proceeds further in the system. So that's the um, uh, hot trough uh, system, that's what, how it would help um, with AI. So thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Yes, there are some cool. questions. Thanks, Simon. Oh. So uh, that was very interesting. Uh, thanks to you and uh, all the other speakers. So I was looking to the chat and there was no particular question uh, to you. Um, but I think everyone um, is able to, to uh, get in contact with you afterwards, right? Okay, yes. All right. So again, thanks a lot to everyone uh, who was speaking today um, and also thanks a lot to everyone t attending. Um, we will send around a follow-up mail with a link uh, to the slides and the recording and we hope that you got some valuable insights into the topic of AI in finance and hope to see you on the next webcast again.